Run, Dr. Sean, run! <laughs> Hey, what's up? Leslie Samuel here from Interactive Biology TV, where we discover biology in everyday life. I'm excited. Again, we are doing another episode of The Good Doctor. The last one went over very well. So we're going to do the pilot episode, the first episode. And our goal here is to understand the biology that's happening. This first part starts in the airport. Dr. Sean is on his way for his first day of work, trying to get to the hospital. But then this happens. A lot of sounds happening. Probably a lot of stimulation for him. Yep, he feels uncomfortable. And then... Ooh. Ay, ay, ay. The little kid gets hit. Ooh, that's a lot of blood. I'm a doctor. Let me take a look. Let me take a look. All right, we got a doctor. That's good. His jugular vein's been cut. Does anyone have a clean cloth? Please. Okay, so the jugular vein has been cut. Let's talk about that. So the head is obviously very important, and we have the brain in there, and a lot of important things that are happening. While the brain only makes up about 2% of the body weight, it gets about 20% of the blood that's coming from the heart. It's taking the oxygen and nutrients there. Those get used by the brain and the muscles in the face and the other structures. And once the oxygen is used, the deoxygenated blood has to get back to the heart. We have two main jugular veins that are draining that deoxygenated blood from the head back to the heart. That's the internal and the external jugular veins. The external jugular vein is draining blood from the back of the head and deeper parts of the face. The internal jugular vein, that is a bigger one. And that's draining blood from the brain and the superficial parts of the face. You don't want that to be cut. Well, you don't really want any of it to be cut, but if that one gets cut, that can cause a lot of blood to escape. And that's what we're probably looking at here. Let's continue. Someone. I have a fresh change of clothes in my bag. That's great. Of course, you got the smartphone cameras out. You're killing him. I'm saving his life. He was bleeding out. No, you have it in the wrong place. I think I remember enough of Anatomy 101 to know where the jugular vein is. You would be in the right place if he were an adult. He's not an adult. He is a boy, which means you're also putting pressure on his trachea, which means he's not currently breathing. That's not good. You have to put the pressure higher up. Show him, Dr. Shang. There. <gasps> All right, let's talk about that a little bit. The trachea, that's the windpipe. When I breathe in, <gasps> that air goes via the trachea into my two bronchi, and then that takes the air to the lungs. That's how you can get the oxygen that you need into the bloodstream and all of that good stuff. If you are compressing the trachea, air can't flow the way it needs to flow, especially when this guy has obviously some serious issues going on, being with a cut jugular and maybe other things. Applying pressure there, not a good thing. And obviously now, after moving his hands, the air was able to pass more easily. Let's carry on. Ooh, that's not good. Some glass. He'll be fine. <laughs> who are you? Tell him who you are. Hello. I'm Dr. Sean Murphy. I'm a surgical resident at San Jose St. Bonaventure Hospital. Oh, yeah. This is my part. <laughs> All right, looking at the veins in that arm. The circulatory system, venous distension. The veins in the boy's left arm are popping. Is that bad? I, I don't see. Intrathoracic pressure. Okay, let's talk about that. There's a lot there. You notice he was paying attention to the veins in his arms. Why would he be paying attention there? In all the words that you saw there on the screen, it mentioned venous distension. Basically, the veins in his arms were popping. That has to do with higher pressure. 
How would that take place? If something is putting pressure on the heart and preventing it from expanding, the heart will not be able to pump as well. There's more pressure on the heart, and when there's more pressure on the heart, any of the vessels that are coming to the heart, you're gonna have an increase in pressure there as well. Think about a hose. If you have a hose and you step on one part of the hose, the part leading into that section where you're putting that higher pressure, there's gonna be more pressure there as well. If you put a hole there, you'll see that the water will be escaping and it'll go higher because of that increased pressure. It's the same thing here. If something is causing increased intrathoracic pressure, the pressure in the thoracic area, that is gonna cause venous distension in the arms because the blood from the arms, the deoxygenated blood, is going back via those veins to get back to the heart. Let's continue. Lung is in distress. Lung is in distress. Yes. Who here has a sharp knife? Blade five inches or longer? Nobody? You should start artificial respiration. He's going to start breathing very soon. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing, but this guy, he's special. I like him, he's awesome. Just start artificial re respiration because he's gonna stop breathing. Why is he gonna stop breathing? We're gonna get into that. All right, Dr. Sean needs a knife Can't be or something in. sharp. Oh, I need a knife. Where do you keep the knives people forget they're traveling with? A knife. Sure. Anything else? I do also need a narrow six-foot tube and high-proof alcohol and gloves and baggage handling tape, but I'm going to get the alcohol from the duty-free store and the tube from the back of the soda machine. Can you imagine him just being by the TSA, hey, I need a knife? Like, yeah, I, I want to kill somebody. It's obviously not going to go over very well. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Well, I wish you all the luck with that, but I'm not going to give you a knife. No, I need a knife. It, it's, it's very, there is a medical emergency. There's a medical emergency. That one, that one right near the top looks very sharp. Would you get it for me? Well, I'm not going to give you a knife. That's I'll there. ask you. There's not the time. <laughs> weapon, weapon. This is like one one time I was traveling from St. Martin to come back to the U.S. and this, the TSA people were being very picky. And I was like, "Why are you guys tripping? It's not like I have a bomb in there." That was not smart. They didn't they didn't enjoy that joke. And I would imagine they're not enjoying this very much. Run, Doctor Sean, run! Move! Get out of the way! Oh! Drop it! Ooh, Ooh idiot! You're lucky we didn't just shoot. No, he's trying to save my son's life. Yeah, he is. Excuse me. Yeah, he's doing the artificial Excuse restoration. Me, well, I guess he's trying to sterilize the area. I don't know how much sterilization that's gonna do, but. I love how he's so into what he's doing right now. <laughs> yeah, like that fully cleaned it. Better than nothing though. Incision should take place two ribs down. Okay, so let's explain what's happening here before he actually does this. The lungs are not just here chilling inside your thoracic region. They're inside a container, and we're gonna call that container the pleural sac. So you have this pleural sac, the lungs are inside there, and between the, 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 the walls of the sac and the lungs, there's a pleural space. The pressure that's in that space has to be very specific. If there's too much pressure there, the lungs won't be able to expand. Regulating that pressure is extremely important in order for you to breathe regularly. With a tension pneumothorax, there's some kind of damage to the lungs and maybe even to the pleural sac so that what happens is air escapes and gets into that pleural space. And the more you breathe in, the more air fills in that space. And now if you have all this air in that space, that puts more pressure on the lungs and it's not able to expand to take in air well. That's a bad thing. That is a tension pneumothorax. In this case, something needs to happen to get that air out of that space. 
So let's see what he does. Uh oh. This is gonna be so cool. Check this out. Uh, you see that bubbles? Okay, well, why the bottom? The air will continue to leak and accumulate until the damage can be properly repaired. The tube allows the air to get out, the water in the bottle stops the air from coming back in. A homemade one way valve. <laughs> there you <It's> go. <laughs> you saved his life. He saved his life. Dr. Sean is the man, yo! So he made this device that allows air to go one way and when he puts the tube into that plural space, the air that was trapped inside the plural space was able to escape and because it's a one-way valve, it can only go in one direction, the water, the fluid, is gonna prevent air from going back in and as you can imagine, you have that the, the, the lung that is kind of pulling away from the plural space and as the air comes out, now it's able to expand and you saw that he took that deep breath like, oh, finally, I'm able to breathe. Dr. Sean saves the day. Yay! I want to hug Dr. Sean too. Dr. Sean, I love you. Now that's not the end of the story, but that is the end of this section for this video. In the next video, I'm going to go into some more complications that happened in this episode with this young man. So after you hit like and subscribe, make sure to check that out because there's some more interesting things happening. And if you have a TV show or cartoon or whatever that you would like me to explain the biology of, go ahead and leave that comment down below. Leslie Samuel here from Interactive Biology TV where we discover biology in everyday life and I'll see you next time.